Hey. Hey, hey. You got your coffee? I got my coffee. <laughs> got the drink. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So let's go. Um, so I do see that we already have some people joining us on this uh, odd time for this show. Uh, so first off, Corey, thanks so much for joining and uh, making some time in your busy schedule uh, for uh, for speaking to me and speaking to the rest of the uh, the gang here. So uh, how have you been? How, how's today been for you? It's been pretty good, man. Firstly, uh, thanks for having me and thanks for accommodating my schedule because it can get kind of crazy. So I appreciate you doing this on a day that I could actually join and, you mm-hmm. know, take some time to, to to chat with you man so i appreciate that yeah at least we could do of course no worries no worries so great well um as i as i, as I t- said earlier so what i'd like to do is I, I just want to kick it off with a very informal interview and then after that uh, open it up for q a for the people joining um we might see some people leaving and coming in during the actual show and we'll uh well we'll make it a great time of course um so cool first things first so how did you actually end up with with music as a whole so what was your musical upbringing like uh, Corey? um you know t- typical black household man soul music mm-hmm. and you know what i'm saying gospel <laughs> music and those kinds of things as a kid but you know yeah. what's what's the interesting is uh so i'm a 70s kid so i'm a little older mm-hmm. than uh, even my 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 peer group, yeah, <laughs> like core group of friends, you know, by say eight years or so, most of my friends were born in the eighties. I was born in the seventies. Oh wow! But yeah. the reason for that is that um, 80, 81, 82, 83, Those are the years when when rap music was making its first records. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, so I grew up obviously with a lot of soul music and all that kind of stuff, but I also um, grew up with my mom playing Curtis Blow records, like the first rap record she was yeah. playing it at the club. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, all that yeah, kind absolutely. of stuff. You lived place. through that whole genesis, then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it was like you you grew up in a household with you know Stevie Wonder and anybody else that's hot but then Curtis Blow too <laughs> and you know what I'm saying and as and then as things progressed through the 80s I started mm-hmm. to uh you know there was always music present uh, ever present everywhere and so it became like um I mean I've always you know, my my and I've said this before in, in another forum but my uncle's a jazz jazz trumpeteer my dad is a singer who was uh, in a group that I think was signed to Chess Records at some point. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, a gospel soul kind of group. Yeah, because uh, we were from Chicago, and so that's that's all in, in you know mm-hmm. the place where my mom and everybody grew up. That neighborhood is the neighborhood with Chess Records and all the blues, the the the, the kind of yeah the heyday of blues. All that stuff is just a part <laughs> of the DNA of the family. You know what I mean? So yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. And then you, of course, you, that, 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 that had an impact on you, of course, as well. So how did you then start to make music yourselves? How, how did that evolve? And uh, did, you, did you pick up anything specific uh, while growing up? Or is that something that evolved later on? Um, you know, I always wanted to play instruments. Uh, I can remember, like, and I don't know, I I don't know if it's just, you know, adolescence and, and growing up, you tend to, well, well I'm going to imitate playing the drums, or mm-hmm. I want somebody to teach me how to play this thing and teach me how to play that thing. To me, it just feels like, doesn't everybody? I don't know. Maybe it's just <laughs> because it's still so common. In, in well, life. most people I, I talk to, that's, you're absolutely 100% spot on. Everyone yeah. <laughs> there start playing music at a certain age, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I I do. There's some distinct moments that uh, that stand out, and and one moment is I wanted to take piano lessons. We couldn't afford that, mm-hmm. uh, so we did not do that. And I can remember um, it was such a it was a it was like agony almost that I want to take piano lessons. And, and you know everybody I knew that grew up taking piano lessons mm-hmm. said they mm-hmm. hated it. But I wanted to do it. <laughs> oh. We just couldn't afford it. You know what I mean? And and oh, I remember yeah. 
Uh, for some reason, we were at some lady's house. And I don't even know who this lady is, but she was in our neighborhood. I don't know why we were at her house. And my mom was talking to her and the lady had a piano in the in her living room. And I was over there. I just couldn't. I was enamored with it. I wanted to mess with that damn piano. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I guess it became a topic for my mom and this this lady that we were there. And mind you, like I said, I don't know why I was there. I was a kid. So they, they mm -hmm. could have been friends. That's all I know. I don't know. But um lady happened to mention that she gives piano lessons. And boy, I perked up. I looked at my mom like, this is our chance. <laughs> 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 oh, perfect. Yeah. And so my mom is straight up. She just kind of laughed it off. She's like, girl, I can't afford those piano lessons. You know, oh. that kind of thing. And you stood um, there with your puppy dog eyes, of course, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that never happened. And then there was another distinct moment where, you know, my uncle is a jazz trumpeteer. And I say jazz trumpeteer, but he really played all kinds of stuff. And he's mm -hmm. played with all kinds of bands and been on tours and all kinds of stuff. He's really an incredible trumpet player. And uh, I remember him saying in the, in the 80s, he was like, yo, I got into playing trumpet because jazz was the hot thing in my day. Like that was, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like we grew up, we happened to learn instruments and, and it's like if you, you know, I mean, you're the cool dude if you know how to play jazz on some yeah. instrument. Then you made we, something we out of yourself, about, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? And so we talk, We were talking about that stuff because I just thought it was dope that he uh, knew how to play the trumpet. I figured, I, okay, I might want to, I know he taught my brother how to play the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Um but the fact of the matter is, I thought it was fascinating, but I didn't want to play the trumpet. I want to play the keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, he said, why don't you rap? You need nothing to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <What? laughs> That's the right? truth if I've so ever seen was, one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ex exactly. You know, and especially it's a time, um, certainly for in the African-American community and, and uh, Latinx communities that, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in that sort of area. Yeah. Or, um, and in a time when they were canceling and getting rid of uh, musical programs and arts programs and all of this kind of stuff. You know what mm -hmm, I mean? So mm -hmm. the way my uncle was exposed to that kind of stuff was because they had it in the schools when he was coming up. So he could learn to play the trumpet and just so happened that jazz was a thing and yeah. a big thing for cool kids. And so he, you know what I mean? It, it just kind of worked out. But that's the same sort of, uh, in, a, in a different way, the same sort of tra trajectory that hip hop had. Hip hop came up out of um, musical and and art programs that were being canceled. So we made yeah. any, we took anything we could get our hands on. And I say we just said the culture of hip hop, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? And then New York, when they were doing things back in the day, like we didn't have certain access. And what we had, we made what we made with it. That became hip hop. You made do, and yeah. So, yeah, you know what I mean? And and so, you know, I've said this many times before, the turntable wasn't made for us to pull it back and forth and crossfade with it. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that's, that's how hip hop does. The MPC was not made for us to, to sample records with it. No. Uh, it was made because Roger Lynn wanted a drummer to accompany his guitar playing. Well, put it in the hands of, <laughs> of inner city youth and it becomes like the de facto tool for hip hop. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of that that sort of trajectory and stuff. And when my uncle said, well, you don't need nothing to rap. Why don't you do that? <laughs> and it probably was more or less because he, he probably was thinking like, I'm not teaching you how to play the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> then we might have had a very different conversation, of course. But where yeah, exactly. did the fascination with the keys come from? I don't know. It's just something really ingrained within you. Yeah, I've just always kind of liked that and thought it was fascinating and and it looked like an easier thing to deal with than say a guitar or something in my mind it just yeah and i just kind of liked the the sound and the idea and it, it was just something i was always drawn to even and and mind you i've never been trained on it i know limited chords but i just love that idea of being able to make melodies with keys and that sort of thing i remember being in high school which is another moment of yeah. being in high school and a friend of mine showed me how to play, you know, some things on the drums. Mm -hmm. And so we would be able to cut class and go to the music room. <laughs> and that the music teacher didn't care what kind of bum was he. I don't know. But he didn't care that we would cut class. <laughs> <laughs> so we would be in there. My God was, uh, uh, God bless his dead, Joe. He, he unfortunately 
passed away uh, yeah. earlier this year. Oh, but that was sorry. my man. He was teaching me how to play the drums. Yeah. And um, although that was cool, I still wanted to kind of know how to play the keys. And then I knew another dude who played saxophone. And he was like, yo, we should start a band and you could be a keyboard player. And I'm like, what makes you think that I know how to play the keys, bro? Like, <laughs> it was just always that thing, just this recur reoccurring thing that just kept coming to me. Somehow, you were the key you know? guy. That's that's the thing, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it was all those different little instances, and just kind of think, you know, music and having something to do with music and being exposed to it and wanting to be involved with music has just been ever present. Perfect, perfect. And then, and how how did you then finally make that transition from um, that? Let's call it a hunger for, for 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 making music into actually starting off with 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 real synthesizers and actually starting up with the with the, the overall Mortbat movement how did that over how did that a, transition happen yeah it, it was a slow progression man i was uh cons i would consider myself an mc at the core of my being mm -hmm. so rapping since since 12 11 yeah and you know what I mean? Just kind of doing that and being around, being the, one of the first dudes in the neighborhood doing that stuff. Anyway, it was a it was a long sort of progression. Eventually, I started making my own music because I didn't quite. Um, there were very few people that I had like a, a good musical synergy with as a, as an MC. Yeah, and so I got tired of bouncing around trying to find that synergy, and so eventually I bought my own MPC and started making music and just over time that became more of my creative outlet than than uh lyrics spitting lyrics you know what i mean yeah and 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 through that time you know just always knowing that uh even though in hip-hop flipping samples and and and, and you know boom bap beat making and all that flipping samples is kind of the core yeah. foundational sort of knowledge you know like a good you know with this finger drumming and good drum programming um but flipping samples and being able to you know bring those musical ideas to life from from records but i always sort of enjoyed more playing things mm -hmm. and yeah i didn't necessarily like when it sounded too traditional but i just knew that i always enjoyed making music more when i could play things Mm -hmm. And so although I got good at, you know, the foundational stuff of just making beats, I could flip a sample with the best of them, drum yeah. program with the best of them. But, you know, my first setup was a, a couple keyboards and an MPC and, you know, obviously a turntable too. But then mm -hmm. I got into both playing, embellishing the melodies and wanting to go further and further. So that kind of brought me to, you know, synthesis at some point down the line, right? Then I kind of felt like if I want to take this further, I want to get into that. But then too, mm -hmm. I was starting to sample, um, you know, was it Mort Garson? Those kinds of things. Yeah. Just uh, I was starting to sample experimental early uh, electronic music. And bringing you know that I mean? back, and yeah, yeah, and, that, and bringing that into the the overall hip hop uh, field yeah, that you had, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then too, I think it was probably ingrained. No, I just thought of another moment. My my sister had a friend who I guess wanted to be her boyfriend, and he <laughs> invited her over to his house for lunch or something. And uh, she's about five years older than me, and she's like, "Yeah, but my brother's coming." And we went <laughs> over there, and he had a Juno and a oh, drum wow. machine. And this was in the 80s and we grew up in chicago so he was a house music producer yeah of and course yeah that's that's super significant also because i think because of growing up in chicago myself being really into hip-hop but growing to chicago the culture is house music and you know that just it's a part of i feel like that's a part of my dna but i've always been a hip-hop head and so I think the whole playing thing and, and being exposed to different things, that just kind of became my thing. I knew at some point I got into synthesis a little more and I knew that I wanted to understand it better. So I went head first and eventually that led to, to modular and, and that sort of thing, too. So, of course. Yeah, great. And then, of course, as you said, that 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 overall history, that that. that cross contamination of house music into hip hop that that's of course something that will 
mm-hmm. that will have a, had a, a tremendous impact on how you then progress that because even though it might have not have been your 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 style or your or your scene it is something that you that you pick up on of course mm-hmm. certainly it, it's certainly and i mean I, when you think about that i mean being in you know i'm i'm talking about like right now you could look at uh, documentaries on the Chicago house scene, house music scene. Yeah. Huge document. Well, I don't know how huge they are, but for me, it's like cult classic stuff. But I'm looking at this stuff, and and what when I'm looking at those documentaries when they're talking about the warehouse and yeah. all of those DJs and producers from Chicago, I feel the way I imagine folks feel when they're looking at documentaries about the start of hip hop in New York. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you grew up in New York at the start of hip hop and when they talk about the park jams and they name all these places and they're talking about, yo, I was there. We used to live down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like when I look at those house documentaries, that's how I feel, because I'm like, yo, we partied our asses off at the warehouse. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. That radio station every day at six o'clock, because that's when the the mix came on. And you know what I mean? It's, It's just a part of the cultural experience of growing up. Of in course. Chicago, you were part of that. You lived through that. That that, that will always yeah. have a have a have a place with with you. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Certainly. Yeah. And then, well, uh, how did you then from 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 that to where you started to say, okay, well, I've started to be really interested in in, in synthesis and the how how everything worked um, on a almost theoretical level and you also said well you need to be a bit more hands-on where it's not like mm-hmm. I'm, i want to program something or, or, or flip your uh, your samples you want to have something yeah. a bit more hands-on how did that then translate into the actual step into modular um well it, it you know i I'm, i won't front i was intimidated by synthesis in general mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. years. Just Who's because, notes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, why not? Right. Who Who hasn't? I feel like it, if you can look at that and not feel something like "oh oh," <laughs> <laughs> when you don't know, then you're a special kind. And then me, I'm sure there's people out there that were not intimidated mm-hmm, by. It. Mm-hmm. But for me, the uh, idea of you know, with my first setup, I had a PK6, even you PK6, was which was basically a rompler. Yeah, no real synthesis happening. It was a rompler with a filter and you know envelopes and that kind of stuff. Uh, then I also had a micro Korg, and I can remember making really dope, like say, leads and bass lines with the micro Korg, and and certainly bass lines that I could embellish my my mm-hmm. uh, with. And uh, I remember inviting a dude on to do a song with me and he was with it. And then I was like, cool, here's a recording of the beat and I'll track it out. And when I went to track it out, I did something messed up and erased the entire sound set in the microphone. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, and I think I was trying to back up the thing or do something. I should have just tracked the stupid thing out. Anyway, that was just a <laughs> long, and, and that was so discouraging. And I knew right then, I was like, I don't know this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course, yeah. And, and time, yeah, and as time went on, and I, I you know, um, synthesizers become a, became a little more affordable and more abundant, and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I just started digging in, and I knew that I want to incorporate synthesis. I'm sampling these records. I'm interested in those tones, and honestly, I just wanted to push into a different place. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, huge tribe called quest fan i'm a huge stevie wonder fan i'm a huge like these but the, those there's something about the melodics of those kinds of those types of musics you, you got you got tribe called quest they're so freaking yeah. melodic but it goes everywhere so absolutely huge. yeah yeah you know what i mean and and the more i learned about you know just kind of how they did their thing and um it just kind of appealed to me a little more than other ways of doing stuff. And and then, you know, that changed the what, what I sampled when I would sample. And mm-hmm. then it would make me want to go deeper and find it. Then I started learning more about the fact that Stevie Wonder's greatest albums in the 70s that I'm such a fan of uh, were made with Tonto, as you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, like, wow. He, Didn't know yeah, that. Tonto was in the <laughs> background of that. Like when, and, and I, um, Cecil and and those guys like Stevie Wonder showed up and was like, "Yo, I got this record that y'all made. Show me how to make that. What the hell were you doing?" And so as I learned more about that kind of stuff, I realized like, "Wait a minute. This has always been a part of, you know, 
soul music's DNA and and urban music, for lack of a better term, because I hate mm -hmm. that urban music term. But, mm -hmm. you know, soul, R&B, hip hop, it's always been a part of the DNA. Like when I think about um, um, Houdini and those kinds of dudes who were using, you know, Fairlight <laughs> joints and yeah. all kinds of technology that was kind of like on the edge of technology when they were doing it. Those kinds of things have always appealed to me. And I just started thinking about it like, well, why am I not into that? And it, it so, yeah. you know, when I look at ModVap, it's really, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's just a continuation of a lineage. Although, you know, I've made this term and, and to, and to sort of denote what I was experimenting with when I was getting into synthesis. But, you know, once I got a, a, a synth, a keyboard, yeah. it was inevitable. Eventually I was going to be in, into uh, Eurorack. And especially because yeah. some of the people that I was around were already doing some Eurorack stuff and, and were all gearheads. So it was just kind of like a natural progression. But I mm -hmm. definitely feel like once I found that blend, I found where I wanted to be the whole damn time. Yeah. Because of that combination of the the pure foundations of music and melodies that you were looking for, but at the same time mm -hmm. also the hands-on uh, physicality of, of music yes. creation. Mm -hmm. And being able to take it into places that, you know, I found with, um, and there's some people that are so prolific with sampling and, and stuff. And yeah. like I said, I'm good at that. Mm -hmm. But I would always find myself at a, certain place with beat making when I sampled a lot where I'd yeah. be like, yo, I want to take it up a half step or I want to, you know what I mean? Drop yeah, it down. Yeah. And then some of the technology, like right now with Ableton, you can just about dream up anything with your rack. You could just about dream up anything that you might want to do. There's a tool out there to accommodate you. Sure thing. And yeah. uh, there may have been things then too, but I just didn't have the knowledge to be able to take advantage of whatever it was, and maybe some things just didn't exist. So, you know, I've always wanted to take things a little further with my beat making and, and getting into synthesis and Eurac in specific gave me the ability to take, just experiment and go other places and go higher and fill yeah. the room with melody. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so, and really, and still, and really take it on that journey that you, where you wanted to take be yeah, unlimited yeah. by or not 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 held back by the technology because you can just expand on that technology uh, the way you wish it yeah mm -hmm. brilliant so so what was what were your first modules that you uh that you started to use uh back in that time uh so the first system that i had and i was fortunate enough to obviously be doing b-boy tech report which yep. is where the the name comes from b-boy tech I never intended to be called B-Boy Tech. It's just I had a blog called B-Boy Tech Report. Yeah. <laughs> and I think people just assumed that I was going by the name B-Boy Tech and that this is my <laughs> report. But really, it was about a matter of saying, um, yo. More I like your audience that you I'm wanted to. Uh... I'm into technology. I'm into hip hop. And I'm going to talk about the shit that we care about. Yeah. <laughs> and then somebody's <laughs> like, yo, B-Boy Tech, that's a dope name. And I'm like, whose name is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well if it works it works right yeah why not <laughs> yeah, hey, I, it's stuck i roll with it it's cool yeah sure sure sometimes uh, you don't, you don't that, choose your own name it just got bestowed upon you <laughs> yeah, the name chose me pretty much yeah, absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kinda, it kind of worked out but because of doing b-boy tech report i'm sorry i got tangential there but because yeah, of no worries no worries um I was reviewing a lot of stuff. And so Pittsburgh Modulus sent me a system to review. Um, and that review was on B-Boy Tech Report. If you were to go there and search Pittsburgh Modulus, it would come up. But the interesting thing about that is that was my first exposure to Modula in my own hands. Um, like I had friends that were doing that stuff and that was cool. Uh, but then I got that system and I can't remember what the system was called and I don't know. I do know that there was DNA symbiotic waves and I thought that was a really dope module. Yeah. Um, even when I got gave that system back after the review, I eventually went and bought that particular module. But I remember having this, the, uh, I don't know, man. I, I grabbed so many things real quick. <laughs> I, it was a landfall. It was just kind of, 
I don't know. Uh, I think I had the spherical wavetable navigator mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, I think Chord V1 was one of those things that eventually when I got that, I kind of felt like I was finding stuff that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, there was, there was really quite a lot that of one, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. And then we, we were talking about which year are we talking about right, right around this time? Maybe 2015, 2016. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm trying to get to B-Boy Tech Report right now, but I get a uh, an error 500. So that's a server error. So I think the, uh, the server might oh, need great. to be bounced, but yeah. I'll uh, have to look at that. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I appreciate it. I just wanted to, so because we, we do have the companion channel there as well, so I wanted to yeah. share that link with the rest of the audience, but then, <laughs> then this happened. Sorry well, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. I'll fix it. It'll be up in it because that's not, that's an ever-present site that's going to be around for good. So Absolutely. I'll just have to fix that. But yeah, B-Boy Tech Report will be back up shortly, but modbap.com, they can always find anything I'm into. That's that. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, well, and that's actually a nice segue because that's, of course, that's the other thing that well, I'm, I'm really interested in. So how did then actually becoming a Eurorack maker come to be? How did that happen? Because that's that's not, that's 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 quite a big step for people to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I've always sort of had ideas. I've always wanted to do some things. I mean, even before I got into synthesis, I can remember a friend and myself sketching out drum machines that we would love to make um and so there's always been that idea of like yo i would love to be able to do this mm -hmm. or do that and then so through b-boy tech report i was able to do a lot of reviews give a lot of feedback and then that led to me uh going into uh beta testing for different things nice yeah and i so that was exciting times too when people would reach out and be like yo uh, good feedback. You want to beta test this thing and that thing? And so it became, you know, from that, when you're beta testing, you're obviously looking for bugs and things that don't quite work right. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're not sure if it's working right. And then the suggestions come up. And then I would be like, yo, it wouldn't it be easier? You know, beta testers kind of have that that leverage to say, yo, wouldn't it be easier to just do it this way? Or why doesn't it do this? And so there was a lot of that sort of stuff happening. Yeah. And what I started realizing is that um, some of the ideas and some of the requests were becoming features of the things that I was helping to beta test. And, yeah. and I love that. I thought that was so cool. It was a cool feeling. And that um, kind of bolstered that idea that like maybe one day mm -hmm. I can make stuff. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? It, 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 you know, I've mentioned before that it, it definitely kind of gave me confidence that I had good ideas. And uh and then the more I've gotten to know a lot of makers and doing B-Boy Tech Report, interviewing people, and and I started realizing, like, you know, the, the, the these folks aren't very different than I am. And I never want to put myself, you know, some of these people are legendary in my eyes. So I don't yeah. want to, you know, I, I put some of these folks on pedestals. I just truly do. So um, um, I just kind of thought that their stories sometimes felt familiar how they began to do something and sometimes it's not too overly complicated about why they want to do something or how they got into it mm -hmm. and so i think you know the reality is that's one of those things that's always been in the back of my mind like i said different sketches and so eventually that sort of culmination of reviewing stuff and giving feedback becoming a a, a a beta tester for various brands and doing little things here and there and um, it just kind of made me think that features requests becoming yeah. actual features and stuff. It kind of made me think like, yo, I can do this. So my little sketchbook of ideas don't have to just be a sketchbook. Um, Absolutely, and especially yeah. the more I learned about modular, the more I started thinking like, yo, I, I wish there was a thing like this and why don't people do something like this? But it, it, it's a weird thing to say like, why doesn't somebody do something like this? And it's like, well, you want it so bad? Go do it. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. So, did you get any help from from any of your uh, your your Eurorack maker friends when you when you bit the bullet and actually started uh, going for it? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. I no, no worries. Talking. So, did you get any help from any of your uh, friendly Eurorack maker friends, or when you um, um, when you started developing the performer? Well, yeah, not really. Uh, I always talk about ideas with my closest friends. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really came down to I had a very specific thing that I wanted to do. And so I uh, engaged a developer and said, let's go. <laughs> That's pretty much what I mean. Um, and, and it just worked out. Yeah. So how did then the uh, the actual idea for the performer itself came to uh, came to be? I use I use a lot of performance effects in my uh, beat sets mm -hmm. and in just making music in general. So there is the X Y effects on the Akai uh, Force and NPCs. Yeah. Uh, there are the the core Chaosolator. I have one of those, and then the SP four hundred four. I have one of those. And I used some combination of either one or all of them in, in, at different times. Um, you know, I used to perform with a 404 and my uh, force with the with the XY effects and a small skiff. And at, at first it wasn't a very small skiff, but mm -hmm. um, that became such a huge part of the way I performed. I, but at the same time, it was like, yo, I have some very specific things that I want these things to do that they don't do. And there's a lot of stuff that some of these things do that I don't want any parts of. <laughs> <laughs> so I started kind of putting together and, and, you know, I sketched something out one day and I was just like, yeah, it'd be dope to do something like that. That would be fresh. Yeah. Um, and, and the opportunity came. Um, and I've told this story before. Maybe some, some people that might hear this might know this story, but we did a mod map, um, uh, panel discussion uh, at Synthplex and you know it was a panel discussion strictly yeah. dedicated to Mod Map that's on YouTube actually I think and, I've seen that yeah um, indeed yeah yeah it's on some b-boy tech report YouTube channel and we did that discussion it was a, a, mm -hmm. a really decent turnout and <clears throat> a lot of stuff we were talking about doing and you know we had mod map on the brain there was a lot of talk about the music the sort of movement and this idea of combining those two and it was just a great fill-in situation and somebody asked so what are the tools that you use to to do that and i remember thinking like well here's the tools that i use but quite frankly there's no de facto thing out there because we're kind of creating this as we go right now mm -hmm, yeah and then that was kind of the moment when I said, I'm going to have to make some stuff. <laughs> like, that's it. Like, it, it just, it was calling to me, like, you need to make some stuff. And then funny thing about that, that weekend, flying high about that experience, and it was great. And I knew I had to make some stuff. And then I went to work at my day job that week and mm -hmm. uh, was told that, was asked to move to Kansas City to uh, yeah, move to Kansas City because I'm an IT manager, and at that point, the day job was a senior manager, and they asked me to move to Kansas City, uh, and, and I guess I would have become a director over there and, and manage this group of folks and kind of be the man on campus or that sort of thing. And and all I heard was move to Kansas City. Yeah, and that's all I needed to know. I got <laughs> nothing against anybody that lives in Kansas City because I, you know, for for part of my group that I worked with and managed out there uh, I had to go out there pretty regularly anyway but I'm originally from Chicago I ran from the snow I don't know parts of living in the Midwest anymore <laughs> I came to the West Coast and that's where I live and that's where I'm comfortable at no no day job is gonna make me uproot <laughs> well, <and laughs> you know that, yeah of course and if you're working in IT then well jobs are up for grabs of course so yeah yeah exactly and then you know i don't i don't care if you consider it a career or a job just the and then i know people that have moved for the, but that wasn't what i was on so anyway the we the reason that's relevant is because when i immediately said nope i'm not moving to kansas city then they said well you got 90 days and we'll give you a severance package and i was like wow, <laughs> wow. We, we over there now we like this like how to get you know it's crazy because you know um uh, I was a stellar employee and uh, a leader in this place, but it's just the organization was changing yeah. and they needed me in a different place. 
I couldn't accommodate that. So then the alternative was, well, we got nothing for you here. Oh, <laughs> so wow. Take these 90 days and, and this, this Severus package and see you later. So that was literally three days after we did the Mod Bap uh, chat. Yeah. Or, or at Plex. And, and when I knew that I had to make modules of my own because of that experience, and literally that was Saturday and Tuesday, this thing happened. Jeez, and wow. so I, 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 I didn't even, it didn't feel, you know, I guess some people would get that kind of news and be like, yo, they just dropped a bomb on me. I'm depressed now. Yeah. You know, they were like, you want to talk it over to your wife? I'm like, no, nah, I don't need to talk that over with my wife. Me and my wife both know we live in LA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all good, cool, no, no problem. So I knew right then I was going to use at least some of that uh, severance to yeah. make mod that modular. Oh, so that was a well, it was a blessing in disguise in that in that way, perhaps even. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow, certainly. great. Yep. yep. Oh wow. I would say so. So that that was actually the the, the whole well, launch of that rocket ship for the performer, mm -hmm. and then of course after that you started working on the Os Osiris as well. But did you do did you uh, get back into IT afterwards? Oh yeah, I'm still in in IT, and I have some milestones I want to hit before you know I walk mm -hmm. away from that as a day job. But you know I don't think we're far off. You know oh, what I mean? Nice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, but that's cool. uh, and I do see a lot of people in IT that 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 have embraced um, modular or synthesis in general. Um, myself included. There's a lot of musicians in IT. Oh, I don't know geez, what it yeah. is. There's tons of musicians in IT. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely brilliant. So then, what's next for uh, for mo that modular? So you've got two well unanimously positively uh, received modules out there. I think that uh, when Performer was released, everyone was uh, was lauding that that module. Uh, everyone thought that it could never be topped, and then you released Osiris just a couple of months back, and people were even more positive about that. So I'm now thinking, what's what's next? Well, um, there's quite a few things uh, in the plans and in the works right so i'm just taking time doing one thing at a time mm -hmm. i will tell you that when i did performer i had three things that i wanted to launch so that was one of three things that i wanted to launch osiris was not one of them okay um and i think that they were equally as dope in my mind anyway i could i can't wait to actually bring them to life but they you know i, I decided coming out the gate that i think you know let's pick one thing launch with that let's see how this goes and let's make that the best thing right yeah and I, everything i thought that at that time i maybe had it was three things that i wanted to launch with and i maybe had six to eight designs uh uh that i felt strongly about that could become real things and i just decided like performer is 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 unique enough and it's probably the thing that i want to use <laughs> more than anything yeah. and so i decided to launch with that and just kind of make a good go of it and mm -hmm. um then osiris came about uh that was a, a design as well <clears throat> of kind of a bigger lot of design so i have quite a few designs of things and i'm just going to kind of take it as it as it goes i would like to be able to to uh launch a couple things a year Wow, but be fantastic. I also want to yeah. launch quality things. You know what mm -hmm. I mean. So I'm going to be expanding the product line as time goes on. So I think if we were to circle back, anybody that like, if we look, if I was to look back, maybe look ahead mm -hmm. three to five years from now, um, yeah, I could definitely see a full product line and and just a lot of cool things to come looking forward to it looking forward to it so we we're already way over time in regards to the actual interview so i apologize for that so one of my uh my, the questions i always want to ask my guests is well if you were to give yourself one piece of advice um if you go back in time what would that advice be in relationship to either synthesis music making or or eurorack what would that advice be to uh to young Corey? do it now 
<laughs> wow. I think that, that would be the, the biggest advice. Because I'll tell you, um, so I have, uh, uh, I went to tech school and got an electronics degree in the 90s. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was specifically inspired by the fact that we were doing a lot of music and making a lot of music and producing and rapping and doing all kinds of stuff. And I knew early on that uh, they were starting to use, you know, Ataris and whatever the thing was in the studios, the computers were starting to become uh, a part of the setup in the studio, even as archaic as they were. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be able to have a plan B. <clears throat> So I went to school and I got a, a degree in electronics because I specifically declared somebody's going to need to fix all of that stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's and very it, pragmatic, I, of course. Yeah. Yes. I thought of it like that was literally I don't, like it was yesterday. I'm like, yo, they use computers and somebody's going to need to fix that stuff. And if this co music career thing don't work out for us, I still want to be around music equipment and music and making music and somehow as a part of my life. So I went and I got a degree in electronics. And at the end of that associate's degree, you have a senior project and I was supposed to build a theremin. And ah, yeah. um, I did not. And my partner, my guy, he, he's my, my daughter's uh, godfather. Uh, we were planning on building a Moog theremin together. I found it on the internet and I was like, yo, check this out. This thing crazy. We're gonna build this. And he was like, Yup, let's build it. That's our senior project. Well, anyway, we didn't because somebody came around and was like, Yo, Corey, do you know that there is a youth program around your neighborhood and they're giving uh, uh, technical school credits for graduation if you come and volunteer on Saturdays to help maintain computers? Oh. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, word? Well, I'm going over there. So oh, wow. to circle back to your question, if I could give myself advice back then, yeah. I would say, the hell with those computers, build the theremin, because I think I would have been on track to doing what I do now yeah. back then. You would have had a couple of uh, couple of years of uh, of head start then, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, that's a good one. Oh, well, I liked it. I, li I liked the, the, the backstory then as well. So before mm -hmm. I want to turn it over to the uh, to the audience, I will also want to give you the opportunity if you've got any questions for me, because I've been asking you all kinds of things, all kind of personal things. So uh, I want to return the favor as well. Um, well, I, I don't know. That's a, that caught me off guard there. Uh, how'd you get into music? <laughs> um. Well, that's a good one, and I've never talked about this before. So I actually, yeah, so um, we actually moved from a very um, uh, secular environment, and we moved into a very uh, Catholic environment. So and my mom and dad, they, they, they said, well, you, you can just go to the Catholic school because that's the only school that was there. And we actually, so when every of my friends uh, went to do their first communion, I, of course, I, I helped out and I was part of the whole thing, of course, but I didn't do communion, of course. Um, but one of the things that we also did, we, we, we sang a lot. We had to sing in church as well, and I really liked that. So I actually, after everyone did their first communion, uh, a couple of us, we actually joined the uh, <laughs> the kids' choir. <laughs> Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> and there I was, the only secular kid uh, surrounded with all this Catholic imagery. Well, and I and I enjoyed it. I truly enjoyed it. So no worries there. So that's well, a great question, Corey. Thanks. That's dope. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's something that we have in, in common because I remember going to church as a youngster, and I was uh, kind of forced to join the choir. <laughs> it wasn't like they beat me up we were in the choir, but they were like, well, we all do stuff, so you're going to be in the choir. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'm in the choir. <laughs> it's funny. We got that in common. Absolutely. We shake hands on that. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Corey. Right. So um, thanks so much. So I, I do see that we have an, uh, a decent turnout. So if anyone has any questions for Corey, uh, please raise your hand I'll, and we'll get you up on stage. If you're unable or if you don't, just don't want to, uh, but you do have a question, just write them in the companion channel and we'll uh, read them out loud. So uh, go ahead. In the meantime, let's see where we at. So any any plans for the weekend in the meantime, Corey, until we wait for the first questions to appear? I'm just gonna hang out with the wife. Um, I actually, uh, we, we were 
probably gonna head out right after this, but no real plans, really. You know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. trying to kick it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so what's what's the COVID situation yeah. nowadays in uh, in uh, in LA? It's it's still very much uh, like heavy mandates on just about everything. We have to be masked up. You can't go into a restaurant and eat unless you have proof of vaccination. And, yeah. You know, those kinds of things. So, you know, but at any rate, it's just good to kind of get outside and oh, just yeah, even just have around, right? And, you know, we don't mind wearing masks if we're going to go into stores or wherever we're going to go. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's the yeah. least we can do, of course. Yeah, no. no. I need to, I'll probably need to go to San Diego in January. So I'm still keeping an eye on what's happening on the, on the West Coast. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed that everything's going to go well in the meantime. So, um, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, so I think that we had a, a very clear discussion because we don't have any questions from the audience. Uh, oh, oh, I do see that Adograph. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to invite Adograph on stage and see uh, what they have to uh, to ask. Yeah, there you go. Adograph, the uh, stage is yours. But you might need yeah, to up, unmute it. You m- might need to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Welcome. <laughs> So yeah, I appreciate you guys doing this. Um, I'm sitting here. I have Osiris and Performer in my case right now. And oh, I'm just looking so at the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the layouts of these things, and I'm just wondering what, how did you go about deciding which like buttons and knobs to use? Are they like just your favorites, or because they happen to be mine? So I appreciate them. Yeah. Um, well, for performer, the arcade buttons had to be. That was a core design element uh, from inception. Um, and I just kind of like that idea of arcade buttons in, in Eurorack. And also I use um, DJ Tech Tools stuff, and they have <clears throat> the MIDI Fighter. Oh, I've, yeah. always, I've always liked the MIDI Fighter and... You know, I just kind of like what they do. There's a lot of different brands that I like. Like, it's funny that I'm I'm kind of inspired sometimes from a brand perspective by looking at other brands. And some of those brands, you wouldn't think. So one of them is DJ Tech Tools. One of them is, well, I don't know. There's other ones that may be even women's clothing lines. There's something about design and, and uh, cohesiveness that, you know, these different things have. So... Um, but without being too tangential, I just kind of thought that the arcade buttons, it, it felt cool and it felt um, um, nostalgic. And I thought that would be a cool way to interact with the effects. And so, yeah, I put that together that way. And I wanted it to almost be reminiscent of how I would use the, the uh, like if I was using the forces effects, X, Y effects, I like the way you have the effects you interact with, but then you have knobs there that you can interact with. And obviously the same thing was happening when I would use the SP404. And so those things that I was always u- already using sort of informed how I did the layout on that. And I remember some people, even to this day, may not like the fact that the, uh, the IO is at the bottom. Um, but for me, I like the knobs at the top, and I don't care where the buttons are. So <laughs> <laughs> I should—I guess I shouldn't say I don't care where the buttons are. But I will say that I went through quite a few iterations where, at one point, all of the buttons were laid out, uh, um, you know, just uh, vertically, with with a mm. knob beside. So it was like, you know what I mean? A button, a knob, a button, a knob, a button, a knob, going straight up and down. And, you know, it just didn't, one, it didn't leave room for I.O. And and so there's just kind of that iterative process. But one thing I can honestly say is I felt that I, I knew this wouldn't be uh, the last thing that, that I designed. And so I, I, I was serious about choosing the right sort of components from a interface, a user interface perspective where I could create a line of product line that will be cohesive. So I, I went through and, and you know, I made sure to choose these these knobs. I wanted that to be a part of what my, my look was like. And um, symmetry is important to me. You may notice that from looking at, you know, maybe Osiris, 
symmetry is just really important to me with, with the modules. I like a sort of clean layout. I like things to be sort of symmetrical. I don't really, for my own designs, I don't like things to be, you know, kind of scattered around, even if there's cool panel layouts and stuff, like a cool panel designs and stuff. Mm -hmm. I like symmetry because I want to be able to, once you use the module a couple of times, you should just be able to be familiar and move back and forth. So if you add a graph, if you're looking at, if you have Osiris in front of you, like one of the things with, with symmetry was that you'll notice that there's the eight knobs, right? Four knobs down either side. Yep. Three knobs in the middle. But then the top two knobs are bigger knobs and the, the, the lower knobs are, uh, you know, medium size. Then I have just kind of pots in the middle that are skinnier than those knobs. So that to me creates this whole synergy. Um, the two buttons on the bottom for sync and uh, uh, quantize, then a trigger button. It it all has to have like a symmetric sort of feel uh, for me. So that that's a huge part of layout for me. Um, yeah, that's just, just a huge part of the thing for me. I definitely see it. Even on Performer with the two buttons on each side, the two smaller exactly. buttons. You can see that. So you once once you start to see that, and then two, like look at look at um, Osiris, and you see timbre mode, and then right across from it, you have timbre amount. But to me, it was important to have them right across from each other that way. Um, I guess that's just how my my brain works. But yeah, <laughs> symmetry is super important for me. So, you, Mike, you, you, you'll be able to, to actually start to develop that muscle memory where you don't even need to look at your module, but you know exactly where to, uh, where to, what to change if you want to get to a certain sound. Yep. Certainly, certainly, yep. Great. Great question, uh, Adograph. Any, any follow-up questions? I don't know if it's really a question, just the thing I've noticed. Um, even in discussing ModBap, and as a hip-hop head myself, it's, it's there's a strange disconnect between electronic music and hip hop, even though hip hop uses electronic music tools for its creation, and it has since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a. I think that's a. That's a. I feel like that's purist, like a, a purist sort of approach to things. Jazz musicians had that. Hip hop has that. Um, you know, I mean, it's all in the slang culturally. Yeah. Stay real. Be you know what I mean? <laughs> be be real and stay true and you know what I mean? I don't have any problems with that kind of stuff, but that's you know, um I just kind of feel like if if I was gonna be honest with myself, electronic music is a part of who I am, right? But I am of yes. hip hop culture. You know what I I'm totally saying? feel that. Yeah, I, I just couldn't see you know, to me I've Feel more myself with doing all of that and combining it into what I call mod bab than I than if I didn't, you know what I mean. But at the same time, nobody's gonna tell me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I can turn on my MPC if and and program beats and flip records with the best of them. But what I enjoy doing is that and synthesis together. Like it's just that's you know what I'm saying, and yeah. I think that when you come from a place of authenticity, nobody could tell you what is and what isn't, whatever you say it is. Uh, I mean, you know, I know what my history is, right? So we all know if you come, if you come from a place of hip hop and you've been involved in the community, like you, it is what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't mean everybody's gonna love everything you do or, you know, there's certainly gonna be uh, adversity or whatever, but. You're right, hip hop, and, and like I said, jazz. Most most music's like that that come from that sort of like really uh, cultural background, like jazz and hip hop and those sorts of things. It's, even rock. I mean, it's always going to be the purest sort of state of mind. Mm -hmm. Where if you're doing something outside of what we know as the norm, then that may, you no. Know, it may get shunned, right? So I think that's why, you know, the the you know electronic music and hip hop is not typically thought of in the same breadth. But at the same time, 
electronic music has always been present in hip hop. It's just that sampling and, and beat making is, has been more prevalent, right? Like when I say you go back, you look at, um, I mean, all kinds of stuff today, especially a lot of people ain't doing sampling today. But then when you go back to people like uh, Houdini and UTFO and all of these folks, yeah, there was always break beats there, but you know, cats were using electronics in the music and just giving it the soul of hip hop. Like it, it to me, it's it's more common than we realize. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. And at the same Thank time, you very I, much. yeah, you could also say that there's a lot of mm -hmm. hip hop in in electronic music nowadays as well. Even more now mm -hmm. than than back then. Certainly, certainly, because hip hop is popular culture now. It wasn't like that before. But now hip hop yeah, is true, popular culture, so true, you'll hear yeah. remnants of it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, in pop pop music, in in rock, even 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 in heavy metal nowadays, yep. of course. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. No, great. Well, yep. uh, great comment, Adograph. Thanks so much for that. So let me just see if we have any additional questions. I don't think so. So then I think, um, well, we're almost at the top of the hour then, uh, <laughs> Corey. So we, yeah. um, well, I've never have had the, it's uh, timed this perfectly. So again, I do want to thank you for your time on this uh, busy Saturday, of course. And I do want to thank you for uh, for joining. Uh, we might get a last minute question there. Okay, well, uh, our pleasure, uh, Mark here, who just thanked us for the interview. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably get you back on the show uh, sooner rather than later because uh, I really truly enjoyed this. And um, yeah, no great. Problem, anytime. Appreciate you you having me on, and thanks you all for listening. Great. So for everyone who's uh, either listening now live or listening to this recording, this has been a presentation of the Modular Clubhouse, uh, present on Discord and on YouTube. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, please uh, reach out to me directly at jesper at themodularclubhouse.nl or just drop a comment uh, down below. Uh, for now, I would like to thank everyone for their time and uh, Corey Banks in particular for joining. And uh, I would say, please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you for my next one. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>